If there's one movie that keeps bringing me back to it over and over again, it has to be The Shining. Now, I don't find The, the Shining particularly scary, but I do find it haunting. And I see why people keep getting pulled back to it. At face value, The Shining is a super simple story. It's about a man going crazy, trying to kill his family, and ghosts. But what Kubrick does is he layers the film with different aspects of meaning, both visually, then within its performances, and then narratively, and lastly, by what he doesn't show. I always found that what made The Shining so interesting is the Overlook itself. Is the Overlook the same thing as the ghosts? Is there an evil in it that's separate, hidden? Is this nefarious force plotting and willful? See, it's the mystery of it that makes the movie so compelling. You know that something is wrong, but you can't put your finger on it. And that's what I want to explore today. Going forward, I'd like to address my rule of two. No, it has nothing to do with Master and Apprentice. It's a rule that I use when we see something repeated in a film. It may be a character, a prop, a color, a shot type, but if it happens more than once, it's fair to say that it's in there for a reason, especially when dealing with a director as meticulous as Stanley Kubrick. So let's take a look at one of the first scenes that I want to address. And this is the scene where Halloran and Danny talk about the shining ability. Mr. Halloran, are you scared of this place? No, scared nothing here. It's just that, you know, some places are like people. Some shine and some don't. I guess you could say the Overlook Hotel here has something about it that's like shining. I just want to point out here some brilliant composition that we see. Above Danny's head, there are some knives pointing downward. And uh, this is actually a reference to Democles' sword. Democles' sword is a story of an ancient Greek king. It represents the idea that there is a double-edged quality having power. There is an, always an imminent threat of losing that power. Danny is going to, as we see throughout the movie, have the ability to see the future, but it's also at great cost to him, uh, emotionally and uh, psychologically. Is there something bad here? Well, you know, Doc, when something happens, it can leave a trace of itself behind. Say, like, if someone burns toast. Well, maybe things that happen the other kind of traces behind. Not things that anyone can notice, but things that people who shine can see. Just like they can see things that haven't happened yet. Well, sometimes they can see things that happened a long time ago. I think a lot of things happen right here in this particular hotel over the years and not all of them was good so what Halloran is saying here is really important to the film because it sets up what the nature of the ghosts and paranormal activity in the hotel at least from Halloran's perspective what it is these ghosts aren't like spirits in the traditional sense instead they're the aftermath they're sort of like a stain or an odor like Halloran said that's been left over from terrible things that happened in the hotel. And I think it's important to understand that because it has a historical context, but also because it helps us contrast whatever these things are with the thing that is in room 237. What about room 237? Room 237? You're scared of room 237, ain't you? No, I ain't. Okay, let's look at the scene where Jack meets Lloyd, the bartender. Let's take note of the first thing, which is the visuals of the scene. The entire room is draped with gold, and there's a sign for the gold room. 
the theme of gold may seem like a a tangent or something that isn't really connected with the themes of the film like murder and alcoholism but it's really important to just establish it here also let's look at the color motifs of the room gold green and red these three colors reoccur throughout the entire film i argue that gold represents literally gold and wealth and uh, a sense of opulence green is a representation of the actual evil in the hotel and red is murder and violence in my goddamn soul just a glass of beer already evoking the idea of a deal with the devil okay so it starts off with jack looking straight at us he breaks the fourth wall and what Kubrick is doing here is really interesting because when Jack looks at us, he's actually looking at a mirror on the other side of the bar. And it can be argued that every ghost in the film is actually an aspect of Jack and his psyche. But we're not going to go down that route. And we're going to look more at the route where cinematically Jack is spiking the camera. One of the rules of cinematography is that the actor should never really look at the camera. Kubrick does this deliberately to make us feel unsettled. This allows Kubrick to hide the mystery. He does this a lot throughout the movie where we get an expression and then we see what is causing the expression. Uh, it creates a sense of mystery. And that mystery in this scene is Lloyd. Hi, Lloyd. A little slow tonight, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is, Mr. Torrance. Up until this point, Jack says that the place feels very familiar. And so we have this idea of familiarity and history that's being introduced. And when we see it with Jack's actual interaction with the ghost, it's very personal. It's as if he's known this, this person before. going to be there next April. So here's what. You slip me a bottle of bourbon. A little glass and some ice. You can do that, can't you, Lloyd? You're not too busy, are you? <laughs> no, sir. I'm not busy at all. Good man. You set him up and I'll knock him back, Lloyd. One by one. White man's burden, Lloyd, my man. White man's burden. First, Jack says... You set him up and I'll knock him back. We're assuming that this is the alcohol, but the language itself is violent. It's important because of the context of what he says right after. White man's burden. This is a really strange line. And when I first heard it, it was confusing to me because why are we bringing racial tones into a ghost story? So the term white man's burden comes from an 1899 poem. It proposes that the white man's burden was to raise non-white people out of poverty and ignorance through imperialism. There is a subtext that is connected to the Native American themes within the film. So imperialism in general is being linked here with the alcoholism and with violence. Say Lloyd, it seems I'm temporarily light. <laughs> How's my credit in this joint, anyway? Your credit's fine, Mr. Torrance. That's swell. So credit is really important. First, because it establishes that Jack has been here before. In order to have credit with a place, usually you are a returning customer. Secondly, it also shows that Jack is forming a contract with the hotel. He owes the hotel something for hit the alcohol, and the hotel doesn't want money. Dragon. And all the irreparable harm that it's caused me. After Jack drinks, just look at his face, his expression. He's taken by the evil. It's really interesting to think of the alcohol as a type of truth serum, where Lloyd begins to interrogate Jack. How are things going, Mr. Torrance? Things could be better, Lloyd. Things could be a whole lot better. I hope it's nothing serious. No. 
nothing serious. Just a little problem with the uh, old sperm bank upstairs. <laughs> nothing I can't handle, though, Lloyd. Thanks. Women can't live with them, can't live without them. The way that Jack speaks about his wife is with utter disrespect and disdain. He sounds like a complete misogynist. And what that does in this scene is it adds yet another layer of abuse. So Jack is sort of this epitome of, for lack of better words, patriarchal oppression. What makes this so sophisticated is that Kubrick is showing that this oppressive force is not just a domestic oppression. It is also a social I love one. The little son of a bitch. <laughs> Let's fast forward to the second scene with Jack and the bartender. Jack returns to the gold room. Now, let's stop for a second. This is the second time that he's been in the gold room and the rule of two says that we gotta address it. Let's think about gold. What is gold? Wealth. And what is gold linked with? The gold rush. What was the gold rush? The exploration that drove white people west onto native land. It is the essence of imperialism. And what happened? What came from that? The Native American genocide. Native Americans were killed for their land and later on killed for the oil in their land. And what is oil called? Black gold. Let's also talk about the time period here. The 1920s, this was a time of opulence. It was a time of false wealth that eventually was popped in the Great Depression. So linking Jack with this time period and then setting it in the gold room establishes this overall tone of opulence and false grandeur. <laughs> No charge to Mr. Torrance. No charge? Your money's no good here. Orders from the house. So this is another scene that's doubled here. Originally, Jack had no money in his wallet. Now he does. So what the scene does is it recontextualizes the original scene. The hotel was deceiving him into making a contract with it. Jack doesn't need to pay in cash because the house doesn't want cash. It wants another kind of payment, a payment of violence. So violence now is acting as a type of currency here. It's also important to note how the house is disconnected from Lloyd. It is a separate and mysterious entity. It's calling the shots. Orders from the house. Drink up, Mr. Thomas. I'm the kind of man likes to know who's buying their drinks, Lloyd. It's not a matter that concerns you, Mr. Thomas. At least not at this point. So we get this weird and cryptic message from the bartender that someone in the house, or the house itself, is paying for Jack's drinks. No sooner than that happens, does Grady appear. So we're already getting a connection between Grady and the house. Now this scene with Grady and Jack is such an important scene. Let's start off with the location. Grady takes Jack to the men's room. No women. It's as if that this is a place where men exclude everyone else and have their, their conversations. Kubrick visually is using a wide-angle lens. A wide-angle lens is usually used for environments. That's because the environment itself is so important in this shot. It's a third character. The bathroom is red. Well, where else do we see red? Oh yeah, there. Red is a symbol of violence in this film. Green represents evil the actual evil force that's in the hotel, which is why room 237 is completely covered in green. Kubrick's choice of a wide-angle lens also means that he wants us to see the full body of these characters. So let's look at Jack's posture. 
It's a posture of surrendering. He's surrendering himself to Grady. Now, if you think that this is a stretch, the song that's playing in the background is called The Midnight, The Stars, and You. And its key lyric is, I surrender my love to you. So this idea of surrendering to evil and surrendering to the forces of the Overlook is sort of what Jack is doing here. It's also interesting to point out that midnight is a time of reversal. And I believe that at this point in the movie, we're at the midpoint. What do they call you around here, Jeezy? Uh, Grady, sir. Delbert Grady. We have to take a moment here to talk about the 180 degree rule, which is a basic guideline for all cinematography. What the rule states is that there's an axis between two characters that are talking to each other, right? So if one character is facing left and the other character is facing right, the camera needs to stay on that side of the axis. So imagine a line going between the two characters. I'll put up a diagram right here so you can see. As you can see in the image, the person with the blue shirt is on the left and the person with the pink shirt is on the right. No matter which way we're facing, whether it be camera two or camera three or camera one, that makes it easy for the eye to follow who's talking to who. Now, when we put the camera on the other side, it flips and the person that has the blue shirt is on the right side. So it becomes very disorienting and confusing to the viewer. We just mentioned the music and we, we mentioned how uh, midnight is a time of reversal. Well, this is actually a scene of reversal. We have the character of Delbert Grady, who is this, he comes off as a servant, and we have Jack, who is in this higher place of authority, like a guest to the hotel. However, the power switches between the two of these as the conversation goes on. Both of these characters are caretakers, and so the role of caretaker gets reversed back and forth. And so we have a reversal of power that's going on. And Kubrick demonstrates this visually by crossing the line. It makes us feel uneasy. It makes us feel like the power is shifting. Also, by having these characters switch places, there is also foreshadowing here, especially when we look at the environment and the red that fills the scene. So we're already visually introducing all of these themes. Now let's see what the dialogue says that actually backs up the visuals. Grady? Yes, sir. Delbert Grady. That's right, sir. Uh, Mr. Grady, <clears throat> haven't I seen you somewhere before? What is that? I don't believe so. This is a bit of a side note, but if you were arguing that these ghosts did not exist, this is a really interesting scene because Jack is alone in frame and he's looking at Grady, but it, it actually looks like he's looking in the mirror. His facial expressions is sort of this unhinged quality. So you could really argue that Jack is, is going through this psychologically. And even still, the, the use of mirrors here really show that these characters are foiling each other. They're both the same character. And so whatever Grady has done, it's foreshadowing what Jack will do. Uh -huh. It's coming off now, sir. Uh... <clears throat> Mr. Grady, weren't you once the caretaker here? Why, no, sir. I don't believe so. You a uh, married man, are you, Mr. Grady? Yes, sir. Hmm? I have a wife and uh, two daughters, sir. Hmm? Is Grady playing and, uh, dumb? Or does he actually believe that he's not the caretaker? It's really, really strange when we juxtapose this scene to the next moment. Mr. Grady. Once again, look how these characters are facing each other. It's as if they're mirror images of each other. And now Jack is the one that is holding the cloth, the cloth that's used to clean a servant. You, uh chopped your wife and daughter up into little bits and uh, then you blew your brains out yeah. 
bam, there it is. We just crossed the line. Now watch the reversal. Look at what happens and pay attention to Grady's face. Mr. Grady, you were the caretaker here. Flip back again. I'm sorry to differ with you, sir. But you are the caretaker. You've always been the caretaker. I should know, sir. I've always been here. There it is. There's a change. Jack is no longer in a place of power, but more importantly, look at Grady's shift in disposition. He went from being completely confused to what Jack is talking about to omniscience. And now he's telling Jack that he is the caretaker and listen to that line. That is the most important line possibly in the whole movie. You are the caretaker. You've always been the caretaker. I should know. I've always been here. Who is it that's always been here? Grady? Or is it the evil that's in the hotel? The dark force? Whatever it is that's in room 237 that's haunting this hotel, it's speaking through Grady. Did you know, Mr. Torrance, that your son is attempting to bring an outside party into this situation? Did you know that? No. He is, Mr. Torrance. Who? A nigger. A nigger? By using that racial term, he's A bringing nigger. us back to the moment Cook. where Jack mentioned the white man's burden. Your son has a very great talent. I don't think you are aware how great it is. But he is attempting to use that very talent against your will. Indeed he is, Mr. Torrance, a very willful boy, a rather naughty boy, if I may be so bold, sir. It's his mother. <laughs> she uh, interferes. Once again, we have Jack blaming his wife and reintroduces the idea Perhaps. of misogyny. You see how Kubrick is slowly reintroducing all the themes that were laid out in that earlier bar scene. You don't mind my saying so. Perhaps a bit more. My girls, sir, they didn't care for the overlook at first. One of them actually stole a pack of matches and tried to burn it down. But I corrected them, sir. And when my wife tried to prevent me from doing my duty, I corrected her. So the language that Grady is using, although it's first person, it's still omniscient because previously Grady didn't know what Jack was talking about. So we see that this is still the hotel and it's speaking to Jack in a way that it appeals to a weird sense of duty, which is ironic because Jack actually forgoes his duty as a father and husband, but 
He still wants to impose his will on his family. And it's really interesting here also to see the idea of duty in regards to an obligation to the hotel. The term correcting is very important because the correction is the white man's burden. It's imperialism as a form of justification for evil. Danny is a child who's young and vulnerable. Wendy is a woman who has been mistreated by her husband. And Halloran is a black man. All of which represent victims of evil in a society that continues this imperialistic mentality. Now, only on a smaller domestic space. So Kubrick is saying that we have a history of violence in this country that hasn't gone away. It's only gone into the homes. Men, which it seems especially white men, act as perpetrators of this evil through a misguided sense of superiority and duty. The evil of the hotel can be argued was born out of the atrocities of white man's burden. The greatest of which was the genocide of the Native American Indian. If you find that as a stretch, let's quickly go to the scene where Jack is in the pantry. Mr. Torrance, I see you can hardly have taken care of the business we discussed. No need to rub it in, Mr. Grady. I'll deal with that situation as soon as I get out of here. So this is another great example of how Kubrick uses visuals to reinforce the dialogue and, and the acting. All right, so the moment that Grady, who now sounds like a disembodied voice, says business, look what's right behind Jack's head. A box that says Golden Ray. The fact that there's a reference to business and gold is reconnecting with the business that was done in the gold room, the contract that that Jack made with the hotel. This, this contract of evil. He backs away, and what do we get? We get cans with Native Americans on them. What color are they? Red. Continuing the motif of murder and violence. Now I wanna finish up this video by addressing what it is that makes The Shining different. I think we've seen enough of the moments where the Overlook Hotel makes itself present. As you can see, they're far and few between. Like we do have moments throughout the film of the ghosts, but very few times do these ghosts directly interact with the characters. They're more like images, or like Danny says, pictures in a book. Stephen King is known for combining supernatural and personal evil in his novels, and I think that's part of their success. However, when translated to film and the visual medium, it oftentimes fails to carry over. You know, I saw 1408, which is a very similar theme movie, and Dr. Sleep is a great example of this. Spoilers if you haven't seen it, but um, in Dr. Sleep, the director takes all of the iconic moments and just recycles them. But more importantly, he makes the hotel itself like some sort of boogeyman, right? Let's look at this little scene here with, with Abra and Danny. There you are, Abra. You've been very, very bad. You're not Uncle Dan. You're a mask, a false face. Who else should I be? be? You're the hotel, but he's still in there. Masks off then. Why are you smiling? Because you don't know where you're standing. I know these halls like my own face, John. I mean the body you're standing in. The face you're wearing. That's Dan Torrance and you don't know him. Dan Torrance made one stop as soon as he got here. To the boiler room. Well, you can't get more expository than that. Abra tells Danny, you're the overlook. And Danny talks to her with ghost voice and everything. You see, this is just not as effective. The hotel is not omniscient. Apparently, it, it's not aware of what's going on. Like, it's supposed to be this, this super force, but Danny was able to sneak up behind it and turn the boiler on. That immediately reduces the power of this opponent. And it undoes what... Kubrick is trying to show, which is that this is an evil that works through human hands. 
by hiding the overlook, by masking it with the other supernatural element of the ghosts, you're actually creating a hierarchy here, which puts the overlook at the top. And what's really interesting is how persuasive the overlook is. It's very similar to Satan in the story of Adam and Eve, right? Satan doesn't do anything he just persuades eve and you see in, in so many other movies especially the stephen king movies they always go over the top they show their hand they show the evil and they make the evil some sort of force that can be directly attacked or with some sort of limited power the only limited power of the overlook is that it relies on human action to do its evil that my friends is a perfect allegory for the nature of evil itself Evil really isn't a thing. It's like a virus. It's not alive. But once it contaminates its host, it spreads. If evil has a will, it's for more evil. And that's Kubrick's ultimate message. That the true dark force that's behind America is a history of violence. A history of genocide, of enslavement, of imperialism that is cycling through time and is now taking the form of domestic abuse. Kubrick shows this in that final scene with Jack in the photograph. It's really just there to be a commentary on the history of this abuse. Jack has been here, he's committed these atrocities before and he's going to keep committing it. As long as like the photograph, this evil is overlooked. Thank you all for watching. If you like this video, please take the time to like, comment and subscribe. My next videos will be a mini-series tackling one of my favorite works, a video game called Silent Hill 2. I think I'll be delving through horror for this first round of analysis videos, but let's see. I'd love to hear what you think, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.